now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy and Sandy. I'm going to uh, start. What are your expectations on the wild card section? Throw right back at you right now. <laughs> what are you expecting from us? <laughs> I mean, sincerely, is there any burning questions? Is there anything that's, you know, sending you over the edge? I mean, I've got several. <laughs> <laughs> I can share a lot. While they're all, so I have two. Yeah, I know, just think on this. Okay. So think on that. I have two, um, I think fun, because I'm a data geek. I have two fun things uh, that uh, I've been working on at different places, and I thought I would share them. So one of them was um, consecutive years giving. I don't know how many of you like to use this and look at how many donors have given five years consecutively, 10 years consecutively, et cetera. The challenge is if you have donors who have given four out of five years, are they just as important to you as people who have given five out of five? Or if they have given eight out of 10 years, 13 out of 15, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I was at an organization where it was pretty important that they, they were looking at their annual giving group and they wanted to carve out sort of the higher end donors and they, had gone through all their typical things in the past, but they wanted a new way to analyze who else could they potentially segment into a higher giving level or treat more mid-level. So they wanted to use consecutive years giving, but they weren't giving, they weren't getting enough donors qualifying, they weren't getting the results that they wanted. So we came up with a little query, constituent query, that um, used the summary field, uh, um, summary giving amount. So we're going, the first thing to do if you want to use summary fields for giving information and you want to use multiple summary fields in your output, for example, my trick is if there's any criteria that you want in each of the summary fields. So I wanted to do how much did they give in 2017, how much did they give in 2016, how much did they give in 2015, et cetera, et cetera. I knew that my gift date would be important in every summary field. So I put it into my criteria as my very first step. And I know that when I pick that summary field, it will look at my criteria, and any gift-based criteria there, it will automatically put into my summary field. So I don't have to keep selecting gift date, it will already be there. I'll show you what happens in a second. So very first thing I did was gift date between. And then I went to output, and I wanted my constituent ID number, so I get this information back from the system later on. And I selected um, gift summary um, summary amount, et cetera. And I want, this is the key thing, I want to apply criteria to that summary field. And it defaults the criteria in my summary field that I had in my criteria tab. So my very first shot, I was like, yeah, I want it for 2017. And then I just kept going, 20, and I would just change it the gift date over and over and over again. So I wound up with output of 15 years worth of giving. So how much did they give in 2016, how much did they give in 2015, how much did they give in 2014, etc. And before I exported, I went back and I removed my gift date because I don't want to have multiple recurrences. If, if someone gave twice in 2017, I don't want to have them show up twice in my output. I just want them in there once. And I exported this. So I wound up with this chart like this that had all the years giving and the amount that they gave. And at the very right in column Q, I counted how many years out of 15, for example, did they give. And I didn't do a, a plain count, I did a count if. So as long as the amount is greater than zero, I'm going to count it. So in that first row, this person gave 7 out of 15 years. The next person gave 14 out of 15, 11, 13, etc. So I wound up with an import file, and I want to know out of the last five, out of the last ten, and out of the last fifteen years, how many times has everyone in my database, how many years have they given? So I wound up with this import file. So donor ID 12610, they've given uh, seven times out of the last fifteen years, uh, seven times out of the last ten years, and three times out of the last five years. And I'm going to import this back as an attribute. So my category is called number of years giving out of five, out of 10, out of 15. And then because my category is not very descriptive, but I like them to be short, I put in a comment as well. So I'm gonna be able to pull, show me everyone who gave nine years out of 10, plus they live in this neighborhood, plus their last gift amount was X, 
but I'm, I'm going to have this available to me all year, and I just have to keep updating it every year. But it was pretty cool for the um, organization I was doing it for. You're going to find a whole lot more donors this way than if you try and use the consecutive years giving report. Because that consecutive give, giving year report is looking at, you know, years all backed up one uh, consecutively, right? This is going to show you all your loyal donors who just happen not to give one year or two years. But they've loved you forever, you just are ignoring them because it hasn't been back to back. Uh, the biggest uh, feedback I get on doing this, because I did one similar, is I don't want to type it in. I don't want to create my query. And I'm like, what kind of DBA are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. want to feel the query. Save the query, because it is 15 summary fields. It's 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 okay. Okay. But to yeah. create it, be a creative once. Yeah. You know? You're not going to like me after this when I keep insulting you, right? <laughs> Well, but, but truly, that's what happens to us. We get a little bit lazy and we don't want to create the query with 15 yeah. fields, but she always showed you a shortcut to make it Although, possible. I created the query once and then I keep going back to the same query every time I want something fields because I've already done it now yeah. 15 yeah. times. So the next time I want 10 years, I've got it done. I just changed my criteria yeah. and um, yeah, I keep I keep recycling that same query over and over again. Uh, okay. what, uh, what's the context that you're using this information in? So one was time giving and the other was they wanted sort of an upper level for annual giving. So they wanted to know like who to invite to events right. out of the annual giving group. And they um, they went to all donors who gave them like three years out of three years, uh, five years out of five years, that kind of thing. But they so they had really sort of exhausted the ones that they could find easily using things like the years and giving them that sort of stuff. And they were looking at, okay, we've tried like this group here and this group here, what other group can we test? Uh, and this gave them names that they hadn't looked at before because they had one gap right. or some other criteria. So it just gave them a new, some new names that they hadn't sort of exhausted. <coughs> um, so the challenge is you would have to keep this up every year yeah. for it to be really effective. But if you had a very robust plan giving or sort of mid-level, upper-level annual giving program, this would be really, I think, quite interesting. So if you did like a higher value annual giving piece, Okay, the other thing I've been doing. I've got a I've question, yeah. quick question this. What do most people do when, they, when, you, uh, when you create this and you evaluate the giving? In our organization, I would only evaluate actual donations. I would not include the ticket price, the table purchase, the sponsorship. How, yeah, so how I many organizations would go one way versus yeah, exactly. another? Because you might want to say like campaign equals annual giving or something like that, or appeals are one of these, or whatever your gift subtypes are, right? If you put those into your criteria as your very first step, and then you start selecting your summary field over and over again, it will default them in every summary field. Yeah, so yeah, no, it actually goes pretty fast. I understand that. Yeah, my, my question is I just like how many of us would choose the same criteria as in very specifically just look at true donations or using the entire giving as a... I, I'm going to give a comment to that because you know I will. <laughs> <laughs> I, know you I, I, I work in the industry but I am a donor, right? And if I'm paying a thousand dollars to buy a table to come to your event, I'm loyal to you. So I think it's a bad thing not to include the money I spend with your organization. Right? Because I also put money aside for selling auction items because I like wine and I like going to the spa. But you're not counting that just because I didn't give you $500 in cash for a donation, but I spent $1,300 so I can go to a spa day. You know, like to me, it, might, it blows my mind. Now, your fundraisers will have different attitudes toward that all the time. My attitude is I'm loyal to your organization if I'm spending money, period. Anybody else want to? <laughs> so at the BCSPCA, we'll exclude uh, people who purchase uh, kids club uh, camp or love shops just because we find that those people, they're only sending their kids to camp. They don't actually want to donate. Um, their kids just love animals. And then we also have donors who love to donate but hate kids. So it's a very interesting <laughs> where you might exclude it, but I agree with Kathy, if it was like a fundraising event and somebody paid for a ticket, I would still consider that a, a donation. So I guess it just depends on what it is that you're searching for. 
Although, if you're using, so if you're looking for like high end annual giving donors, um, you want to make sure they've given you probably an, an annual gift at some time in the past X years, right? Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, if they're loyal, I think regardless of how they remain loyal, right? As, so if they have an annual giving gift in the last like three years, but since then they've been giving through events, maybe they're still worth treating as loyal, right? Every, yeah, every organization's a little different. It depends how loud the fundraisers are sometimes, right? Like, well, that's yeah. my money. Don't count that over here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you have something else? Okay, so I was doing a plan giving list for someone, and they wanted, um, you know, they must be loyal, and they must be uh, gifts amount of this amount, like $5 minimum a year for the last three years, and they must live in this neighborhood, and be leave postcodes, et cetera, et cetera. And then they said, and I'll remove the Britneys and the Skylers and the Baileys myself. I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? And I hadn't heard this before. So this plan giving officer is in the habit of looking through all the first names and deciding these are really like newer names that have come into vogue in the last 20, 30 years. So these are younger donors that I don't want to bother inviting to something plan giving. They may be loyal supporters to the organization, but I think they're too young to care about plan giving. So I'm going to look at their first names and remove people that I think are the wrong demographic. Cool. Okay, that's really interesting. I've never really like, thought about it that before, right? So I actually found um, a U.S.-based census information about um, the top 200 names for males and females for every generation going back to the 1920s. So right, like David's been popular forever and Daniel's been popular forever, et cetera. But things like um, Brittany and Bailey and Skyler and a couple of other names are more popular since maybe the last 20 or 30 years. So I came up with this list and I assigned what's the oldest generation that this name became popular. So Whitney, for example, became one of the top 200 names in the 80s. So if you're Whitney, you probably are born in the 80s or later. You might be older, but it's not as likely. So, for plan giving, I'm not interested in Wings. And I'm not interested in Willow or Zymina. Uh, and a couple of these other names, right? But if you're a Wanda or a Warren or Xavier, no, not Xavier, uh, Winifred, I want to keep you in my list. So, we're going to put this list up on makepitchsystems.com. I'm telling Catherine. We're going to put this list up and make this available to you. And we're then. Lost. And then yes, yes. this, just yep. to confirm, as a Bailey, I am definitely in my 20s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, you're definitely in my 20s. Yeah. But you're not, I mean, is that like your grandmother's? Bailey, like that might be like a male name from the 50s. I don't know. What was that? I was in my 20s. Yeah, okay. Pretty much spearhead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, what can we, so if we're doing plan giving, plan giving focus, and we want to exclude people that aren't let's say in their 50s or later. So if we want to try to narrow our list and really be focused, and we want to be able to make some assumptions based on your first name, let's see what we can do. So, um, I've got this list that I will share. And uh, you would ask for it from Razor's Edge, everyone's first name, middle name, and nickname is what I would do. And then you would do a little, so you'd have this open in Excel and you'd have the generational name spreadsheet that we'll share. Or you can come up with your own version and add names as you come across <coughs> your names. And you're going to do a little VLOOKUP. So if you are not already a huge fan of VLOOKUP and use it every day already, um, I've got a tip sheet out in the main auditorium and I can answer any questions you have, but it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread kind of thing <laughs> in my world. So we're going to do a little form formula that says, compare the name Brittany to my list of generational names and give me the information that tells me what generation that, that name Brittany, for example, is from. And in this case, it, it literally came back and said, well, Brittany became popular in the 1980s. So that was the first time that Brittany um, became one of the top 200 most popular names was in the 80s. So likelihood is you're going to be 30 something or younger. Whereas um, Skyler's even younger. Uh, but Emily goes back as far as my list goes back. So Emily, you could be any age, but I know you're not, I know it's um, 
pretty unlikely that Brittany is older than a certain age, but Emily, I, I have no idea. It could be really young, it could be your grandmother's name, your mother's name, it could be um, just, it's a really pretty name, right? Um, same with Jacob, James, it just never got a start. Whereas Jennifer, that became more popular in the 50s, so you're like right in my demographic. You could be younger, because it could be your grandmother's name or something else like that, but at least I know, I have no reason to exclude you. So that formula really works pretty well, but it doesn't know what to do about Scott, and it doesn't know what to do about this Asian name. So I'm then gonna spiff up my formula, because <laughs> I just, I start, I nest things like crazy now. So I'm gonna do, if there's an error when you try to find my, my name based on first name, then try to find it based on middle name. And if there's an error there, then try to find it based on nickname. So Scott by itself became popular in the 40s, and David or Dave became popular like it's been popular forever. So I've got my little list here, I can sort it by generations, and then I can take anyone who's like 1990s, I guess, and above, I can take them off my list. And I can do it a lot faster than manually going through and highlighting and deleting them. My plan giving person thought this was like, yeah, saved her a lot of Anybody come up with anything they want to grill us on? Uh oh. <laughs> I had a question um, come to me talking about newsletter churn and how to calculate that. Um, we don't really store information about newsletters in the Just wondering if anybody stores anything other than like the generic what's your email address and are you okay with getting an email in Fraser's Edge? Like, are you okay with getting a newsletter? No, if, I'm not yeah. wanting to calculate churn, but it's just if you have 10 different newsletters that people can subscribe to, do, does anybody store that information in Fraser's Digital or is that purely in the email tool? Yeah. Like a different communication boundaries, that's kind of my guess, because Fraser's Digital does not seem to be through. So at the SBCA, we have specifics where it's like, do not email, right. and then there's something to say, do not email uh, solicitations. Right. So they're okay with newsletters and other things. So we'll have a few different varieties in the do not solicit, uh, in the solicit codes that give us more detail of what they would like. But as far as their subscriptions, we just use uh, Lumine Online to track that. And then we also, it's not great, but you can get reports out of <laughs> Lumine Online if you fiddle and <laughs> do a few things with it to get what you want. <laughs> When you were saying, wasn't, wasn't you Sarah a few minutes ago that was saying um, if someone is, has unsubscribed from email because you can't even see them? Although, the like, yeah, so with the plugin, if somebody hasn't checked, if they've checked, I don't want to receive email, and then that gets imported into Razor's Edge, and then we can't send an e receipt out of Razor's Edge because of that little checkbox. So I have a query where we look for anyone who has the, after we've done an import, we say, okay, who has that checkbox but doesn't have the solicit code, do not email, and then we just globally add it and then remove that checkbox. That way we can send out their tax receipts by email because most people, they don't want email, but they are happy to save us money and let us send them their tax receipt via email. And that's one of the differences we'll speak to in our session later is the limitations of the reload connector, the workaround we do, and, and definitely want to use them. Yeah, the options that we have to work around those kind of things. Oh, look well, forward to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the challenges we, we are using reload, and we're going to be working with Omatic. We're going to do that probably in September um, with that tool, working, learning all about that tool. So, the challenge I have right now is the receipt log. So, transit, so just so everyone, I'm not sure if everyone's using Relo or not. When you have a transaction in Luminate, the transact, gift transaction information comes into our razor's edge, but then if there's any changes that happen in Luminate, it's really hopeful that someone in Luminate tells someone who's in, on gift processing or myself that the changes have to be made in razor's edge. So the challenge is, is the receipt log is now no longer I would say it's no longer trustworthy because the transactions in Illuminate come over the first time. So, for example, someone I meant to give ten dollars, but it was it went through as a hundred. So we have to manually make those changes. And get processing can speak to it, but there's room for human error here, and 
So that receipt log, what my question is to OMATIC is, have we addressed this challenge with the receipt log? Or does, I want a red flag to pop up, or I want <coughs> something to flag it that, uh-oh, there's something that's happening in Luminate that hasn't been transcribed because it's not in the initial GIF transaction. Mm -hmm. So we do, there's a couple different variations of how that could play out or what the scenario is there. If we're talking about refunds specifically, where we really did go back and, and refund <coughs> money back to yeah. the donor through Luminate, we're actually building that out. Well, my team is supposed to be building that out while I'm here <laughs> this week. So okay. uh, the refunding will come through. Um, and then if we're talking about just changes made to the constituent or to the donation itself, um, we use a date last change. Um, okay. So regardless of your initial gift date, we if it is changed, it'll come back through. And because we do um, deduplication on the way in and we're tracking through multiple ID numbers that are visible and back in, uh, we can actually flag that as an exception. So what it will say is, hey, this transaction already came into Razor's Edge, but it flags it for you so that your 500 transactions that are new and valid and ready to go in will go in. No hands touched, but this one, it, you can call it up and compare them. Right. Okay. All right, let's, let's change gears just for a few minutes. Um, I actually typed up a presentation. It's sitting on my iPad, which I obviously don't have. Really <laughs> to show. Well, no, but I'll, I'll, I can, I, I, what I was putting together was performance optimization for Razor's Edge. So I actually, I'm going to build this out into a, a proper big presentation. But let's talk about this right now because it's something I'm running into a lot that um, absolutely surprises me. How many people are re running queries that take hours or exports and it's just painful, right? Yeah. So there are things that you can do to fix some of that. And I don't think that people know this. Um, one of the things is, have you got Blackboard involved? Have you done some distributed processing on your servers? Like, have you, have you built a second server to take on some of this processing? So, so just think about it. There's other things that you might be able to do. Like, so that's for the bigger sites that have millions of records and everything. I have seen this because they've had to distribute data. So you can talk to me about that after. I'm still talking to Blackboard about looking at uh, some of the sites. Just because I, I, I can't go to your site, run a query, and I wait hours to get the answer when I know that it can be faster. One of the things I saw was how some of the queries are being done, and that's, or how the process is being done, and that's why it's brutally slow. The one that I saw was somebody was putting their kill file in quick letters. So the kill file, kill query, has 80,000 records in it. Now, does everybody understand how quick letters run? Right? The first one, it, it's priority order, right? So if somebody's in this query, it, they won't be in this query, they won't, like, you know, like it, it always goes in priority order. So by putting your kill query in here, you have now slowed down your server, you've pissed off all your users. And everything else. So what you have to do, instead of putting a kill query in the quick letters and trying to get them to fall out, like get rid of the people that don't belong, do them with your merge queries first. And so somebody will say to me, well, oh my god, but I got 10 segments, or I got 20 segments. I'm like, so what? I create my, I've got a kill query, I got query A, or sorry, 1A. 1A is segment 1, segment 2, segment 3, you know, like I segment them in queries. Then I merge them against the kill so I can get a much smaller data set. So a lot of times people don't think about this, but you want smaller data sets. And everyone's like, yes, yeah, smaller data sets. Because Razor's Edge wants to work with the smaller data set. So once you've got your, I call them my query Bs, right? There's one merged to the kill, where you're doing your sub queries. So now you've got your list of your B queries. The B queries can go into your quick letters. Now you get the right person in the right segment. Do you know what I mean? Like, so if there's the husband and wife, and one, one belongs in the higher level, you're not going to ship it to both. Do you know, like, all that stuff that you want to do. Um, anyways, my point is, is I actually ran into this out of sight where they were putting their kill query in quick letters because they were trying to eliminate people from it without realizing that they were the ones that were grinding the server to all. So everybody else is complaining about trying to work during this process, and that's part of the problem. Or it was just taking super long to run. That's why it's taking super long to run. If you just build your queries, you build your process, it's easy. I've been doing this for years. Like, you know, like you know how to do it and you just you're just gonna get on that same note, how many people run reports with just filters? 
right? You go to the report parameter and then you just say, oh, I want only my constituent codes of board members or something. That's okay, a board member is a small query, right? But if it's something that's a bigger query, write the query first and attach the query to your report parameter. Of course, yeah. It's going to run dramatically faster depending on your database. Everybody got this? Look for smaller data sets. That's my biggest hint. But I've, I've seemed to have run into this a lot recently. So the other one was similar. What were they doing? Can I get a question before you get on to the next subject? So Same subject. Or topic. It's okay, I lost it. Okay, so uh, so when we do segmentation, the kill file or the exception file, what we call it, we have, sure. we have one. But what I normally do is I run the quick letters to do the segmentation process and then because there's no priority sequence in segmentation, I build it into the name, right? So that the so that the order is the order that I want the most important people are at the top. And then for my output query, that's where I apply the exceptions sure. to afterwards. But what you're saying is that yes, I do have those larger groups, but then I'm only applying the exceptions at the end. And I can see how that wouldn't work necessarily with smaller shops because what they're doing is they're writing the constituent appeal at the time of segmentation, whereas what we do is we have a placeholder because it takes us two or three months from running the list to mailing it out. So the constituent appeal, the actual appeal is fed through a back feed file, not through the segmentation. Only the placeholder is there for the segmentation. So is, is that sort of, that's related to what you were doing, but that's how we handle it, where we apply all the exceptions at once. And then when the processing is in there, they see, oh, look, there's some temporary file, there's a temporary placeholder. So they'll know, because the mailing hasn't gone out yet, they'll know, oh, I have to look at the previous mailings, not the one that has the placeholder. So You run the risk there, though, that the head of the householder, the head of household is in the kill file, but not the spouse. Oh, right? probably. Because if the head of household is in the kill file, you've lost both him and, the, like, both them and the spouse. Whereas if you run it first, you still have a spouse. Try mm. well, well, and better for make you. sure all your head of household are like your most mailable. But right, okay. I, I don't use head of household very much either. I don't trust it because Kathy gives a hundred dollars. <coughs> My partner gives a hundred dollars, so he's given a hundred dollars. They get we give at different times, right? So then you mark one of our records as head of household. So. Only one of us will show up, but it might be the wrong person that's going to show up because I gave five years ago, but he just gave this year. Do you see the problem? So I don't like head out. How I manage that is with soft credits, but also with the solicit code. I have a solicit code that I use that says has another record. So I turn off one of the records. Does that make sense? So when I'm pulling all my exports up, I do I say give me both. Don't give me just the head of household because you've now lost those people that are marked as head of household but haven't given recently. That should be worth the price of admission if you haven't thought about it before. <laughs> the price for admission, but you, do, do you follow what I'm getting at? It's something I find a lot of times like I get to analyze what is actually being produced, you know, and then, then we go back and we, I, I do a lot of testing. It's like, okay, Kathy's name came up and then I go back into the database. What is Kathy doing? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Kathy's married to so and so, and he gave more, but he's not showing up on my list. Do, do you see what I mean? Like, so the the best way for me, anyways, over the years, was creating that solicit code has another record. I haven't come up with anything else intelligent, <laughs> um, and I do that, but not just for husbands and wives and the whole head of household. It's Kathy is also president of Lincoln Systems, but I want only Kathy to get the mail. So Wicked Systems has the solicit code, do not mail, has another record. Kathy's husband has, do not mail, has another record. Kathy's foundation has another, do you see what I mean? So there's only one person out of the, all the different ways that I would give through my different methodologies, make sense? It, and, and, it's, and it catches more people to mail to. Oh. Sounds like less, but it actually more. So there's also when, I'm not sure if it's segmentation or when you were exporting, but there's, if the person is an individual as well as a contact at an organization is what you're talking about, right? So similar. Similar, yeah. So what, what our 
group, our annual giving group, says, oh, well, if they're a contact at that organization and they're an individual, we definitely want to mail to them as an individual, but we have no, we're not sure if they're still a contact at that organization. So they're going to get hit at work and they're going to get hit at home because we want to hit them twice because we have a budget here and we have to have certain numbers. And they don't know if that person is still in that role or not. So if they moved on, then the organization will still get it. And whoever's receiving mail, being the receiver of the person who's left the organization, that's important to annual giving to make sure the organization receives the piece of mail, even if the contact name isn't accurate, right? So I don't know if that's a waste of mail, but our process is, is that we will mail to you at home and at work if you're a contact of an organization that meets our criteria. And I, I'm okay with that, except if I own the business. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. Some of you guys mail me two pieces of mail right now. Yeah. I get the Kathy Mikic, or sorry, the Kathy <coughs> Mikic personal, and the Kathy Mikic president of Mikic System. So I get two pieces of mail from that's two intentional. Mail. We, that's intentional. We intend to mail you like that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you to ignore us. <laughs> But I'm the business owner. See, that's the difference for me. Yes. It's the if it's if I'm Kathy make it to tell us, then go ahead and send it to me and tell us. Right. But if it's the same address, like are you not deduping your addresses? I spend a lot of time when I pull data out, I cleanse that data, I look at I I, I I sort on addresses, I, I Excel lets you find duplicates. Boom, I'm looking for them right away, skimming. Yeah. 70,000 records I'll skim, right? Just to say. Oh, I got a problem in my database. <laughs> if I've got like a whole ton of things going on there, then I know that the people I've trained haven't been using the has another record. Do you see what I'm getting at? So, anyways, these are just little tricks. Another thing I ran into recently is <laughs> people tell me this one. I love this one. Um, I have a background many, many years ago. I was an IT manager. So, how many people have IT background? Like, literally, hardware, you had to support stuff, right? Okay, you got some of that. Okay. Everybody forgets this piece. If I'm sitting on this machine and this query is taking forever, or the export is taking forever, one of my very first questions is Have you tried it on another machine? And I'm dead serious about this because everybody, because technology has come so far, everybody forgets some of the basics. The basics are, you know, it might be your machine. That's the problem. Okay, just, just think about this. Walk over to another machine in a different building, in a different floor, and if it's working a hell of a lot faster, then there's something wrong with your machine, your network interface card, your hub or your switch or anything else. That's when you call your IT people in and say, look, I run the query over here. It takes three minutes. I run it on my machine. It's taking 10. Help. Right? Like, you know. When, when you want to get that kind of support, give your IT people a lot more uh, information. You can't just say it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? So try it on another machine. The other thing, like on your machine, is um, are you cleaning your temp files? Are you defragging your machines? And I know this isn't Razor's Edge you know, talk, but it's stuff we have forgotten about. I've been in the industry way too long now, so I forget. But then on the other hand, if I'm having a lot of problems, I do all the basics right now first before I call the IT people and say, you know, Sarah's machine sucks, but Sam's is great. I don't know what's going on. They're the same machine, because I've now looked, and they're both running 64 bit of this and that and the other thing. Well, then there's something else going on. And a lot of times we forget to look at the actual technology. We just say Razor's Edge sucks. You know, it's query sucks, or you know what I mean? Like, don't, my point is, is don't accept the speeds that you're getting. You follow that? Don't accept what you're getting. Go try it somewhere else. Maybe you're going to get some improvements. Because I've seen that for sure. Um, there was one other one that, that I got hit with recently, which I lost. I was going to say, oh, or. I have a question, and I was outside for a bit, so I'm not sure if you covered it. Can you just refresh us on um, when you're building queries? What's the perfect, like, how do we improve the performance based on what order and where we put our parentheses? Because there is something to do with what order it is. You get different results sometimes. You shouldn't get different results, but it, it does, your query is run top down. So put your narrowest piece at the top, right? So if you have, um, if you have like a gift date range that's a year, and then you have 100 appeals to check, put the gift date range first, not the list of appeals first. 
Right, so that, that's going to help. If you're getting different results, results it may be your query is written wrong. I've had a lot of issues, especially in the last like six months a year, with people designing <coughs> queries that say not equal to. Oh, or do not use not one of them. The negatives, the negatives, if you use it, at any negative term in a query, check it. Check it, like if you need to do like three queries to get this to, that are like a positive language versus one query that's like a negative language, Compare the two and see if you're getting exactly the same results. Because I'm finding all the time now, when I say when I have a query that says um, not equal to, not one of, does not equal, I get bad results because I'm excluding things I didn't realize I was excluding, as opposed to keeping the ones I want to keep. Um, so test it out. Take take a couple queries that have like negative language in them. Try reversing the logic, even if it takes you two or three queries and merge queries. And then compare your results, and if you find differences, look at why, and you will find out probably that your negative query is not giving you um, accurate results. It's missing things for some, the whole negative query is free, yeah. When you do a constituent query and say, give me everybody that didn't give to not one of these appeals, for example, so they didn't give to those appeals, but you forgot about everybody else. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I need to draw a better example. I have to think about this for a minute. But it's it's at the constituent level, you do the not one of at, at the gift level. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, you're trying to find people that gave to none of these things, or they're not one of these. Oh, that's what it was. They're not one of these constituent codes, and they gave to this. Or like, do you know, like your and and your ors get all mixed up. Um, but basically, what it'll do, it'll eliminate a whole bunch of the constituents that you didn't even know were being eliminated. So I tried to your example. So my big thing is, uh, if you have like primary solicitor or major given solicitor, or whatever. If you say, um, let's say you're looking for um, you're looking for a list, and you want the primary solicitor to show up. I think we've all come across this, right? And you put in your criteria, um, primary like primary solicitor name not blank, for example, right? You won't get people that don't have primary right. solicitor because it's a negative. Um, so it's just whenever you have negatives, try it out in a different way. Try turning the query upside down and see if you get different results. Because I've found like scary things. I remembered my whole thing. I forgot. Yeah. How many people use split gifts? Oh. Right. We have to now. Okay. Let me, let me back up. Years ago, I was a huge advocate and still am of not of not splitting gifts in Razor's Edge because I. Personally, I hate it because when you're trying to get your data out, it's not always easy. Um, like, you know, running Razor's Edge can reports, everything comes out, it all balances. When you export data, it's not always accurate. And I want to talk about that in a minute. But so I used to tell all my organizations never split a gift, right? Put in three gifts, I don't care. Um, if you can stick to that, try, try to. But the problem is, is we've become more sophisticated as organizations. Because now donors are giving that $10,000 gift and they want it to go to three places. Or the $10 million gift that has to go to six places. Does everybody follow what's, what, where I'm going with this, right? So for all my years of jumping up and down, I'm still going to a lot of sites that have to split gifts. They can't seem to get around it. There is a bug in Razor's Edge, and I'm going to send the link to the user group, to Tamara. I'm going to beg you. Mm -hmm to call Blackwell, like get on with this, I want you to put it on there because there's a but. I have three $100 million campaigns I'm working on right now, and I cannot get accurate data out. Hmm. Here's what's happening. I've got the split will be X dollars to A campaign. Oops, <laughs> I can't do this. Um, sorry, so it's the, um, the pledge. So there's a, there's a pledge split between, right, say, let's say three campaigns. Then what happens, you know when you have your pledge balances? Mm -hmm. So you're in export and you're trying to bring up your pledge balances. It'll bring out the pledge balance up here, the total. Okay, so let's say the pledge balance was eh, $9,000. These will not come out as pledge balances. They come out as the, the original amount. So even if there's a balance on those those splits, so now I got these three very sophisticated organizations that want to write really fancy crystal reports, and what we're getting here is absolute garbage. 
So I've been starting to fight this fight, and I would need, I need your help. <laughs> Serious. Well, the yeah. more people that talk about it to black and say, well, this is an issue, it happens. It's absolutely the most painful thing. The, the original uh, gift could have been, say, $18,000. The first $3,000 payment came in, so we should have $3,000 here. <coughs> uh, does this make sense? Like, that is the balance for each of the campaigns. That's not what Razor's Edge will produce the next work. Does it give you nothing, or does it give you 9000 It gives you the original amount. In each one of those? Yes. <laughs> no, no, the original split amount. The original split amount, though. Sorry. You can't get the balance, the balance of a split amount in a, camp in a pledge. I was on the phone with Law Quad, Crystal Reports folks, for two and a half hours proving it. And finally, they just came and I said, you're right, it's a problem. <laughs> I'm like, but I need to fix it. What are we going to do? This is, this is problematic. It also affects it if you use a query using a summary. Um, it, it splits it, it counts it twice. Yes. It feels like anyone who gave, say, $5,000 if they gave yeah, the pledge balance. to two different things, it counts it as five grand. Yeah. And then in the export, at least the totals are correct, but then you have to go through and delete them, and it's a lot of manual. The export is not correct at the balance level, though, in the split, the split balance. No, at the summary level, though, it would tell you that they only need 2,500. Well, well, the split, that the, only the top level amount comes out, as far as the pledge. Pledge balances are not what we thought they were. Pledge balance is only on the top level gift amount, not on the split amounts. So I know that I've got three grand outstanding for these three, right? And, and this is by campaign or appeal or by fund. So of course, all our fundraisers are saying, how much more money are we waiting for? How much do I need? And, or where, where are we right now? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm having trouble now. And it's happened, I've run into it three times since January. And then one of the comments I received was, well, you can get into the back end of Razor's Edge and write your crystal reports that way. And I'm like, yeah, but my sites don't have access to their back end. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, so we, I, I can write those reports, but I can't get to the back end. Anyway, so that was the one I wanted to bring up. I'm going to send a link to Tamara. I want to, get, I want to get some action or some movement on this. As far as I'm concerned, this is a bug, and it's a critical one. If we are not getting accurate data coming out of Razor's Edge, are you asking for us to vote on it through the yeah. idea bank? Yeah. Okay, that's what you're asking. Well, the idea bank, like, it, it, there's yeah. something in Black Hawk community. I have certainly gotten confused on the different versions of these. Um, I think it's the idea bank still. Yeah. Sorry, Lori, you have to ask. Yeah. yeah, okay, but I'll, I'll make sure I get the right link for it. But I think even if you're not splitting gifts right now, still vote on it because you're going to run into this problem. Do you know what I mean? Like it's one of these things where even if you're not an organization that is splitting things up two ways, you're going to run into it. You're going to remember me being angry. <laughs> you know? So why don't you save me from being angry? It, it is also a problem that we are doing it the same way. I will have two entries or three entries because I need to make sure it goes to the correct fund. Yeah. And then I have to do a consolidated tax receipt because I'm going to look stupid, stupid if I send him three tax receipts. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, well, the, it, and the reporting on it also, it just messes everything up. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that it got to this point, because I've been doing it for so long, mm -hmm. I was saying, let's just, just do what you're doing. Yeah. Just make them free gifts, do a consolidated receipt, and oh well. But now I, I'm at sites that are saying, we need to split them. Or they've been split for the last 10 years, and I can't go back and say, okay, we're going to change all this. Cause you, Painful to do that. Anyways, that was the one issue I remember thinking that help. Anything else burning that you have a problem with? Yeah. Oh, there's two. Yeah. Uh, same with uh, the bank split. Yeah. Do you see that so the advantage is split between the gift and the, and the uh, fundraising portion? Of the oh, the advantage receiving? Yeah. And then you, you also have the split. Of the gift, of the donation of the ticket, four or five ways to raise four things. Is that the same issue? Um, I use benefits. Are you using benefits? Yeah, we use benefits. Okay. But this this applies only to pledges. Because yes. you can't, so a year later you can't see how much is left for campaign A, how much is left for campaign B. Because the, when you apply a payment, it doesn't understand that payment is 
for this part of the split pledge. It doesn't really link a payment to a piece of the pledge, it links it to the overall pledge. So at the gift, like cash gifts are not affected by this, this is pledge gifts. Yeah, but it sort of works the yeah. same with events is what I'm saying. The gift side of the transaction and the event side of the transaction is sort of looks like a pledge and the event splits. So if you had an event with 10 sports teams and people are lying on the end of a pick, uh, that their donation can go to three or four different uh, teams, uh, on the gift side, we have to split it. Yep between the ticket and the, and the donation, which mirrors the ticket and the, and the benefit on the event side. And then when you try and get a report out of how it matches up with the commission of costs. Some of that is challenging. Yeah. I, I, I have been at some sites that are running sophisticated crystal reports on their event side and they don't balance to their gift side. Yeah. And I'm telling them, you need to look at this. <laughs> you need to find out why it's not balancing. Um, uh, all right, a couple of quick ones. So I've had a problem when we signed this uh, solicitor to a recurring gift. You sign them out to give it to a group separately to set it up. But then for the last 10 years, what's happened is people have increased their monthly donation. But the solicitor side amount does not change. Automatically. <laughs> so it stays well, they start donating $100 and they increase to $200. Any ongoing gifts, the solicitor gets assigned $100 instead of the total gift value of $200. So after you put the amendment, are you using amendment? Yeah. So the amendment is not updating the solicitor amount? Yeah. And it lets um, you save the gift? Sorry. It doesn't matter. Wow. It doesn't yeah. require the solicitor amount to balance. No, so I, I get it. No, yeah, that's I a good one. That, yeah. And they're like, I talked so quickly to that one, and they're asking Jeff to go in and manually change every single recurring gift to the system amount to equal the amount. And it's... You can't do it through an import either, right? Because no, you can't do percentage or amount through an import. No. So it's been actually... Sorry. It's going to drive absolutely insane. Yeah. So I can go through and do and chase so many gifts. Yeah. Um, if anyone has some magic solution, I don't think it exists. I think I've actually. Uh, you can try it. You guys yeah, say we designed it. We might get a little bit. We can go out and test it out first, but that's kind of down to the line. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, Matt, it's on. There's a lot of things that you cool. can do through import that we can do. This is oh. all my money that I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Plan giving, you know how those like proposals that you have and they can go back decades, right? So there was 5,000 records that needed a new solicitor assigned and they had all these various okay. So you cannot ch globally change a proposal solicitor, you cannot globally delete a proposal solicitor, and you cannot to import replace a pre an existing proposal solicitor. Unless you can do it through important magic. I'm just realizing, I don't think so, I think I love Please, 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 <laughs> can I change a proposal solicitor through an import? That's a great question. Okay, take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look into it. I that and um, alias and alias type. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, okay. So those are actually both of those things. This is where it comes to home. This is the product manager in the room. Um, both proposal import ID so that we can go into a specific yeah. proposal and change details of it. And alias type are on my roadmap for okay. upcoming changes. Woohoo! Because <laughs> <laughs> Kathy and I ran across this. She, she was going to, um, she had imported something and corrected to an alias. So she was going to do a black box recommended my and home. globally delete the alias type. And I said, do not do it because I've done this to my regret. Don't, I mean, Honestly, Blackbot support. Uh, so Blackbot has, <laughs> they have a recommended suggestion on how to change alias types, which at the very bottom in fine print says, of course this does not affect anything already recorded in your system. So you can globally delete alias types from records. So let's say you have an alias type. Oh, I did this the other day. I, I imported um, birth date into maiden name by mistake, because it's one field off. I don't know what I was doing. And so I wound up with all these aliases of birth date. So I wanted to globally delete my birth date maiden names, because they weren't really maiden names, right? So I was going to globally delete all my maiden names that were birthdays. What winds up happening is the birth date stays, maiden name disappears. So now I have all these blanks. Yeah. 
So I had a, a, a really sweet volunteer come in and fix it for me. You could <laughs> you import with a little carrot. No, because there's no import ID for Ilias. Oh, not for the Ilias. Oh. No, but I meant for the, the main name. Does everybody know that you can import with the um, you carrot? You the right field with no. With no. Yeah, it's with the carrot. Yeah. The shift six. Shift, shift yeah, six. six. Um, and if you want to erase a field, you can go like with my ID, my import ID, and instead of having the value in the field, you put a carrot, the little top hat, whatever that's called, yeah. and the carrot item. But um, it will delete the fields, but it doesn't work for everything. But you know, I wanted it to work for my data because I was embarrassed. And then I got help. Thanks a lot. Anything else? You got a Okay. It is lunchtime though, right? Guys. Oh wait, we need to do a vote about the big room and the small room because the lunch has already been out there for half an hour, so we won't keep you long. So can I just ask, so the two, okay, uh, the, there's going to be a demonstration of the, it's called Illuminate Online, no, it's called the Importomatic Connector, which is